this is question number one. What quantity of compound one must be provided to prepare a 100 milliliter solution with a concentration equal to Ki? So let's go back to the passage. Let's see what Ki is. We know that the concentration with Ki is 60.3 micromolar. So the concentration is 60.3 micromolar. And you guys should know that the conversion of this to you know standard units would be 60.3 times 10 to the negative 6 molar, right? So that's what micro means. And it says, what quantity of compound 1? So um, what mass do we need to prepare a 100 milliliter solution? So you guys should also know that this means we're looking at 60.3 times 10 to the negative 6 moles per liter. And so uh, if we want to convert that to number of moles in 100 milliliters, we know that this is 0 0.1 liters, correct? Um, so if we do 60.3 times 10 to the negative 6 moles per liter times 0 0.1 liters, what are we given? We get 60.3 times 10 to the negative 7 moles, right? Um, let me erase some of this work here. Actually, we don't need this. So we know this is the number of moles we need to get into 100 milliliters, um, sorry, to get it uh, to the same concentration as Ki, which is 60.3 micromolar. So if we need this many moles, well, we, we need to find this, uh, find a way to convert this into um, grams, or I guess milligrams. Well, let's, just, let's see what the uh, molar mass of compound one is. The molar mass is 483.5 grams per mole, right? That's what it says on the passage, so 43.5 grams per mole. So 483.5 grams per mole, and this is the number of moles we have, 60.3 times 10 to the negative 7. So if we just multiply these two, 60.3 times 10 to the negative 7 moles. Well, if we multiply it this way, we can see that we can actually cancel out these mole units, and we'll be left with only the grams. And so this tells us that we're headed in the right direction by multiplying these two together. So we can just um, roughly, uh, well, this is around 484, right? And that will be similar to around 500 or so. So we're looking at 500 grams times 60. And 60.3 can just be rounded to 60 times 10 to the negative 7. So what is that? Well, 500 times 60, what's that equal to? 30,000, but you multiply that 10 to the negative 7, what do you get with that? Um, you get something like 3 times 10 to the negative 3 grams, correct? So we know it's 3 times 10 to the negative 3 grams, but if we look at the answer choices, we're stuck with more of uh, these milligrams. So if we want to convert 3 times 10 to the negative 3 grams to milligrams, again, we know for it's 1,000 milligrams per gram, and if we multiply this, we'll see that we'll be canceling out these units, and we're only left with milligrams, so this tells us um, we're on the right track here. So as we know that's 1,000 milligrams per gram. Um, we have 3 times 10 to the negative 3 grams. Multiply that out, the grams, right, the grams units here cancel out, um, and then we're left with just 3 milligrams. So we're just going to be looking at the answer that's closest to 3 milligrams here, and out of all of these, anything that's now, all of these are pretty far off from 3 milligrams except for D, which means D has to be the correct answer. Um, I guess the, the biggest thing to learn from this question is that whenever, just be careful with the kind of math you're doing. Um, make sure that when, when you do like these kinds of multiplications, um, you're canceling out the units that you don't want anymore. Um, I think some people call that like dimension analysis, um, but I think it's just, simply it's just a good way to see if you're on the right track. Um, whether or not you're multiplying the correct numbers together or not. Um, so this is a Gen Chem topic, and this is basically how I would go about solving this question. If only the concentration of the inhibitor is increased, then both are either the concentration of um, the ESI or the concentration of EI increases. The reason they say or is because, remember, um, this inhibitor, right? This inhibitor can either be bound uh, to the enzyme as enzyme and the inhibitor only, as in this case, or it can be bound um, as when the inhibitor is, or when the enzyme is bound to both the substrate um, and the inhibitor. So in other words, this inhibitor can bind the enzyme itself, or the inhibitor can bind the enzyme when the enzyme is also bound to substrate. That's why they say or here, because um, it doesn't matter. So it's let's look at the way this, this equation looks um, chemically. So let's say we have enzyme 
plus the inhibitor makes enzyme inhibitor complex. Now, if we think about what this question is saying, it says if only the concentration of the inhibitor is increased, right? So if we increase the concentration of this guy, it's telling us that these guys um, will also increase in concentration. And it's asking for what is this an example of? And this is very clearly, um, definitively, the Le Chatelier's principle. Le Chatelier's principle, if you guys don't recall, tells us that um, any time we kind of disturb this equilibrium, so let's say I have an equilibrium A plus B, that leads to the product C plus D, or the other way around. Le Chatelier's principle tells us that any time we disturb this equilibrium, uh, the reaction will occur such that equilibrium is uh, rebalanced. So if I increase, if I add in a bunch of A, then the way this reaction kind of rebalances the equilibrium is it's going to form more products C and D. Um, on the other hand, if I take away the reactants A, then we're going to shift the reaction to the left, increase the amount of B, and decrease the amount of C and D, since this will be um, used to make up for the loss that we, we um, subjected A. Um, so this is Le Chatelier's. If this isn't a clear topic, you definitely 100% need to go and uh, review this topic. It's a very fundamental topic um, in Orgo, or sorry, in Gen Chem. And so it, it's wholly expected of you guys to know exactly what this means. Um, to just briefly go over A, B, and D, the Bose-Einstein principle basically essentially states that, um, it essentially states that when you have multiple molecules um, cooled down to absolute zero, um, these guys will all coalesce into a single quantum state. I don't know if this principle is too important for the MCAT, but since it is included in our practice exam, I would go ahead and memorize the definition for this. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is most commonly known for electrons, basically states that the momentum and both the momentum and position of a moving object, for example, an electron, cannot be known um, with 100% certainty. So what that means is if I absolutely know the momentum of an electron, then I will basically have no idea um, where this electron is. The Pauli exclusion principle, this basically tells us that um, electrons can't occupy the same quantum state um, when they're identical with each other. So if you guys draw orbitals, um, electrons filling up orbitals, you'll notice that sometimes these electrons will, if these are like two different electrons, they will face the opposite direction. And that's because they have to be um, opposite spins with each other or else they cannot exist in the same quantum state. This question, question number three, says, which structural change to compound one would make it more water soluble? Um, well, let's look at compound one. Oh, here we go. Um, we'll notice we have a lot of phenyl groups here, right here, um, here, um, a lot of hydrocarbons. And if it's asking us how to make it more water soluble, we're gonna try to get something that isn't really water soluble and change it to something that's more water soluble. In other words, we're gonna try to get something that's not really polar, non-polar, and try to make it into something that's polar, right? So let's look at these various answer choices. A, replacing benzene CH with N in the ring, right? Well, for example, this group right here, or this group right here. And that will actually make it more water soluble. If you think about um, CH, that's a very non-polar um, molecule. And if you replace it with N, well, N, the nitrogen, can actually accept or serve as a, um, a hydrogen, a hydrogen bond acceptor. Um, so you're basically going from probably something like this into something along these lines here. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it would be something like this. But regardless, because of the because it has a lone pair, this nitrogen would have a lone pair. This lone pair on this nitrogen can uh, serve as an H bond acceptor meaning it's going to be more water soluble. If you don't know exactly what an H1 acceptor is, um, go ahead and look up this term. It is a very important term, but basically it means it's going to make it easier for a group like this to become, um, or to participate in hydrogen bonds. And as we all know, H2O loves to hydrogen bond, so it means it'll be more water soluble. So let's say, let's keep A in the back of our minds for now. Now, B says replacing the C double O, so this carbonyl group, with a C and then CH2. Well, this would be pretty bad, right? Um, like I said, um, water loves to be uh, to H bond. Hydrogen bond, these are very important for water molecules and for things to be soluble in water. And if we have an oxygen, well, this is a great H bond acceptor as well, just like the nitrogen from uh, answer choice A. 
These electrons can serve as H-bond acceptors, which means this carbonyl group is actually going to help this entire molecule dissolve in water. If, just to repeat this logic, if, you like, if something is allowing you to H-bond, um, that will make it more soluble in water because water likes to hydrogen bond um, in, in general. So if I have this group here that allows it to hydrogen bond with water, it's going to make it more water soluble. But ANS choice B is suggesting that we replace it with a hydrocarbon, a CH2 which is not able to hydrogen bond um, with water, making it less water soluble. So B would be a pretty bad answer here. Um, C, similar thing. We're going from something that has a lot of nitrogens. Let me replace all of this. I don't know exactly. Oh. Going from something with a lot of nitrogens, and we're replacing it with something that has a lot of hydrocarbons. Well, what did I say about nitrogens? Great for H bonds. Great for hydrogen bonding. What did I say about hydrocarbons? Not so great for hydrocarbons. Or not, not so great for H bonding. What do we want? We want H bonds, right? Remember, hydrogen bonds allow us to be water soluble. Why is that? Because H2O loves to be, it loves hydrogen bonding. So we want something that can hydrogen bond. Nitrogens can hydrogen bond. These guys cannot. Therefore, replacing this with this would be a bad idea to make it more water soluble. Finally, it says we're going to be replacing Wow, this is pretty annoying. There we go. It says replace NH with NCH3. Now, this is a little bit more tricky, right? Because now we're going from something, they both of these guys, right? They both have nitrogens. And what did I say about nitrogens? Great at H bond accepting. But this answer choice is wrong. And the reason is this NH right here, this hydrogen. When you have something bound to an H, remember, um, hydrogens that are bound to a fluorine an oxygen or a nitrogen, these guys are great H bond donors. So this is another term you guys need to be familiar with. Um, H bond donors and H bond acceptors, as the name implies, they work together to form hydrogen bonds. So hydrogens bound to nitrogens, great H bond donors. And because this nitrogen is going to have lone pairs on it as well, this is a great H bond acceptor as well. Now, this nitrogen here is likely to have um, lone pairs. So both of these nitrogens are great H bond acceptors, except in this case over here, it's also a great H bond donor. Why? Because it has an H attached to a nitrogen. In this case, the hydrogens are attached to a carbon, meaning it cannot serve as an H bond donor. So since it can't act as an H bond donor, um, even though this is a great H bond acceptor, because this acts as both a great H bond acceptor and an H bond donor, this will be more water soluble this would like to H bond more. So transforming NH into NCH3 would make it less water soluble, so we do not want answer choice D. So this leaves us with answer choice A, making answer choice A correct. This is question four of the first passage. It states, in micromolar per second and micromolar, what should the approximate values of KCAT over KMB and KIB, respectively, when the concentration of the inhibitor is 180 micromolar? So we can look to table one for this information here. Um, it said, you know, table one gives us concentrations of compound one with these various values. And we know that compound one, right, is an inhibitor. Inhibitor, such as compound one. So we know this is basically just concentrations of inhibitor. Now we see that as we increase the concentration of compound one, KCAT over KM, it stays actually exactly the same. You know, 0 0.149, 0 0.141, 151, almost identical numbers here. So what that tells us is that we should get, you know, even when the concentration of the inhibitor is raised to 180 micromolar, we're still going to be looking at something around 0.15 um, millimolar per millimolar per second, right? Um, and so if you were to change this into uh, micromolars, well, if it's 0 0.15 per millimolar per second, um, we also know that, you know, one millimolar is equal to 1,000 micromolars. Um, if this conversion seems new to you, definitely make sure to review that. So if we change this into micromolars, we can actually just multiply um, both the numerator and the denominator by a thousand, and we get something left with, oops, 150 per micromolar per second. So we know it's 150, uh, right? Let's see. There we go. 
So we know it's 150. Now, there's only one answer choice where 150 is, is the answer, but just in case, let's make sure that Ki is also 60.3. Well, Ki is an equilibrium constant, right? It's the dissociation constant, so that tells us it's gonna, it should be constant across all um, concentrations of the inhibitor. So even if we increase it, it's gonna stay at 60.3 uh, micromolar, and we see that it does in our answer choice here. So C is the correct answer here.